time as we look at church discipline this morning and uh, consider how we can use this, God, in accordance with your will and your purpose to advance the cause of your purpose and your glory and your kingdom. And so go before us. Holy Spirit, use my mind and my mouth and my lips and my heart, God, to properly discern and to exposit the word of God and also to be encouragement to my brothers and sisters here this morning. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Church discipline. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. We're going to read those few verses there. And we're going to dive into a topic that I hope ends up being a great encouragement to you this morning. If you don't have one of these uh, little outlines, uh, Alex has got them in the back there. Just hold your hand up and he will bring one to you. You'll need that. But Matthew chapter 18, beginning in verse 15, says... If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault, just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. I tell you the truth. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, there I am with them. <clears throat> the, uh, the topic that I've been given is church discipline. And I've entitled it, The Lost Art of Maintaining a Healthy Church. I'm going to go through this very quickly. Uh, really, this topic should take at least a couple of sessions. So I'm going to condense it and move fairly rapidly through it and then share a story with you about some practical application of church discipline. One of the things that, uh, that I think we'd all have to agree with is that God is looking for a holy church. The church is the bride of Christ. God has desire that that bride be pure and undefiled without blemish or wrinkle and that that bride might be presented to Christ at the return of his coming. And so God has given the church responsibility for partially of that part, part, part of the responsibility for the maintenance of that work. Now ultimately God is in charge of the church. He's still head of the church. Christ is the head of the church. But God has given leaders and not just leaders, but just members of the church, responsibility to partner with him in that great and glorious work of keeping the church pure and clean uh, for the coming of Christ. But when you talk about church discipline in any kind of an organized fashion or systematic fashion or biblical fashion, uh, for the most part, most churches don't practice church discipline. Uh, I went to seminary. I've, I've uh, been around a long time. I never went to uh, a class in seminary where they taught how to properly exercise church discipline. It's interesting that the topic of discipline and accountability keeps coming up in our in the conference uh, here uh, this week, and it's, it came up in, in uh, Mr. Boykin's uh, presentation as well. It's an important part of the Christian life, and yet it's uh, it's one that is rarely taught on, and most churches don't know how to practice it. And the result is is that the problems come because they're going to come anyway. You can't stop them from coming. I don't care how wonderful a pastor or a leader you are. The problems will come. And then you're at a crossroads of, is this going to benefit and advance the kingdom of God? Or is this going to leave us damaged and uh, with future problems and a lot of confusion in the fellowship? So that is the crossroads that every pastor and every leader is going to come to on a repetitive basis. In fact, I was, I was kind of, um, I woke up a little bit early this morning and I was praying about sharing and I was thinking about the different things that I'd been through and the Holy Spirit started bringing to mind some of the problems that I've had to address in, in my years as a pastor and I just want to share a few of them with you. There are a ton of them. Uh, the first one that I had to address was the pastor left his wife for the worship leader and I was the associate pastor helping this guy in, uh, in Massachusetts and it was a Calvary Chapel. It was a disaster. I really didn't know how to handle it and I did the very best I could but I didn't have much training. 
uh, false prophets predicting hurricanes on Kauai were coming into our church and were prophesying over people and they actually predicted the day a hurricane would come. Of course, it didn't come. Had to address that problem. Uh, associate pastors undermining the leadership of the church, not just mine, but our entire board. Worship leaders who want to take over the church. Am I the only one that that had happened to? Um, how about a pastor's wife uh, in a church that I was pastoring on the mainland, the youth pastor's wife uh, went out with a car that was borrowed from a friend, a, sh a you know, souped up Chevy, with the youth group, and the youth group decided they wanted to find out how fast this girl could drive, so she went over 125 miles an hour with the youth in the car, no seat belts. Uh, how about a woman leader giving very personal massages uh, to women only to find out that she was an unrepentant bisexual? and she was a women's leader. Pedophiles in the youth ministry, these are problems I've had to deal with. Businessmen selling the same business to multiple people uh, uh, and taking deposits from them. Uh, I've had to deal with sexual assaults, with bestiality, with financial conflicts, with runaway wives, runaway husbands, drug addiction, porn. I mean, I'm just giving you a sampling of what I've dealt with in the last 30 years. Now, I'm sharing that with you just to share with you, I guess, Number one, it's going to be a problem in the church. And number two, you, you need to have an avenue for the resolution of those problems. And I want to suggest to you that what I just read in Matthew 18 is the resolution. Now, if you want to pick a thousand different ways to get around the resolution, you can. The church that you lead or the ministry that you lead will suffer because of it. God is the leader of his church. Jesus Christ is the head of that church. And Jesus himself gave, gave us the remedy on how to resolve these kind of problems that come into the church. Now, I want to go through the outline fairly quickly, and, uh, but before I get there, I just want to talk about some of the things that actually prevent us from exercising the simplicity of what Jesus laid out in Matthew chapter 18. Number one is that we haven't seen it modeled and we don't, don't know how to do it. That's ignorance. That can be rectified uh, by studying the Word of God and hopefully, in a small way, uh, our time together this morning will help. The second reason people don't exercise church discipline is they don't want to be perceived as ju judgmental or unloving. And really, that's pride. That's a desire to be seen by people in a certain way rather than honoring God above all. The third thing is that we don't want the hassle of the corrective process. It's very time consuming to get something corrected biblically. It takes an investment of time and effort, and sometimes apathy and indifference is our problem. We also fear losing longtime friends and ministry associates, because sometimes the church discipline process and simply obeying the word of God as it relates to this process will put your own friendships at risk. The fifth one is that we're afraid of losing church members and their tithe. That amounts to greed. We put our concern about the money in the church over and, over and above the purity of the church. And one of the last ones, and there's certainly others, but we're afraid of lawsuits, and that's the fear of man. The Bible says that the fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord will be kept safe. So at some point, right at the beginning, I just want to say that every one of us in ministry, and this is not a, a, an issue only for pastors, this is an issue for everyone in the church, because this is the model that Jesus laid out for the newest person coming into the church, to the pastor himself, or anyone else in the echelon of leadership within the fellowship, we all are called to deal with sin in the very same way. And so the model is laid out for us. It's described for us very carefully and very clearly. There's certainly some nuances and some, uh, some wiggle room in some areas about how it's applied, but the process is very clear. And so God lays it out. And I want to I uh, challenge you before we even get too far in this message this morning, is I'm challenging you to test the Lord and put the word of God to work. Do it. Just make a decision that you're going to do this. What I'll share with you is that these problems that come into the church are messy no matter what you do. But the difference between a mess without God and a mess with God is huge. Because if you do it God's way, you are going to see the church actually advance through the crisis versus simply survive the crisis. And isn't that the difference between an unbeliever and a believer? We all go through messes in life. But as Christians, our messes advance the purposes of God if we're submitted to the Lord. An unbeliever doesn't have that promise. And sometimes, out of ignorance or indifference or apathy or simple disobedience, we have missed 
significant opportunities to advance the cause of Christ when crisis comes to the church, and instead tried to find a different way, a different model than Matthew 18. Now let me define church discipline for you, and I'm, this is my own definition, and I came up with this yesterday. Uh, so it could be flawed, but this is after years. It, it was funny, my wife uh, and I were talking, and I was assigned this topic, and I've been doing church discipline for probably almost 15 or 20 years now, and, uh, and yet I'd never written a message on it. So I'm, I had to write a message on this thing and put it all together. So it's kind of the essence of what I've been experiencing and doing for 15, 20 years. And so I had to write this definition yesterday. I thought it might be helpful. Church discipline is the corrective process instituted by Christ Jesus to bring repentance, restoration, and recovery to a sinning member of his body and to protect the church from the corrupting influence of sin. Now, maybe you can improve on that, and if you can, I'm very open to your ideas, uh, but that's what the Lord gave me to define church discipline. I want to go through some of the purposes, and I'm going to just touch on these briefly. I've noted scriptures for you. I'm not going to read all these scriptures. I don't have time, uh, but they are there for your, uh, for your future reference. The number one purpose is to glorify God through obedience to his word. The fact that Jesus said to do it should be enough of a reason alone. Secondly, to restore the sinning believer. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, the text tells us that you who are spiritual should restore that person, that sinner, gently. That word is katorizo, and it means to repair something and bring it back to its original condition. And that's our job as pastors or leaders or even just brothers and sisters in the church. Our job is to bring someone back to the proper restored condition as someone that's pure and right before God. The third reason is to preserve the purity and unity of the church. Fourth, to serve as a deterrent to others. We have texts in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy 13 where basically because of uh, serving of false gods, the Lord says stone those people and everyone else will take note that that's probably not a good thing to do. We also have evidence of that in, in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5 where Paul tells uh, Timothy, that those who sin, referring to leaders, are to be rebuked publicly so that others may take warning. So regardless of the whole concept of deterrence in our, in our uh, judicial system, whatever your take on it is, God says deterrent works and uh, punishment works. And so to serve as a deterrent to others is also a benefit to strengthen and grow the church. Now, most people, when they think about church discipline, this is like the last thing on their list because what happens when we have a mess in the church? We lose people, right? Isn't that what most pastors are afraid of? You're gonna have a church split. People are gonna be confused and angry and take sides. But what we found in our fellowship is while there are some that leave, we also get people who actually come because we practice church discipline. I'll never forget we had uh, a number of years ago when we were addressing this, this woman leader who was a bisexual and unrepentant and continuing to practice that lifestyle, uh, we had some new people that were just coming to the church and they wanted to come to the leadership meeting because our leadership meetings are open and they came and sat down and I'm thinking, oh no, you know, they've only been to the church like about four or five times and the husband is just getting tracking with God and they're both sitting there in this church disciplinary process that we had going. And I thought, you know, I'll never see him again, you know. Well, Surprise, surprise, they came to me and they said later, we have never been to a church where church discipline is practiced. We're coming to this church. We've been in churches that have a mess and it's turmoil and confusion and conflict and no one knows what happened and people simply disappear, people are fired and there's no explanation and there's this gossip and slander that goes on and it's so unhealthy, we've never seen it addressed so clearly and so biblically. This is our church. So I want to encourage you that if you think church discipline is damaging to the church, to the contrary, it actually can bring growth to the church because uh, surprising as it might be, people are looking for internal integrity, authenticity, and holiness in the church. Another reason and purpose for church discipline is to avoid God's discipline of the local church. Because in 1 Corinthians 11, when Paul is talking about communion, basically he says, it's important that you guys judge yourselves because if you don't judge yourselves, God will judge you. And so he invites us to be self-examining. Revelation chapter 2, when he's talking to the church of Pergamum and Thyatira, he says, because you wouldn't judge yourself, I am going to judge you. So God says, I want you as the church to judge yourselves. 
I want you to be those that watch over the church and care for the church and love one another enough to help people be mended and corrected and pure in their relationship before God. And the last one that I'll mention is to vindicate the integrity and honor of God. First Peter says that we're to live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of his visitation. And so the, even the world is hoping and praying that the church will be pure. What's the biggest problem that unbelievers have with the church? Hypocrisy. And part of the reason that the church struggles with hypocrisy, besides the fact that we're all still struggling and not perfected yet, is because oftentimes the church doesn't ever take care of the problems. We preach it from the pulpit, but when, when it comes to the actual problems, we're kind of stumbling along like blind men, not quite sure how to handle the situation. And again, I want to refer you to Matthew 18. Jonathan Edwards said this about church discipline. He says, if strict discipline and thereby strict morals were maintained in the church, it would in all probability be one of the most powerful means of conviction and conversion towards those who are outside the church. Powerful. He's correct. Let me give you some of the scriptural support for church discipline. Give you some relational examples. Father-son relationship. Proverbs 13, 24. He who spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is careful to discipline him. Basically, we've got that model of a father-son relationship that's a part of the Christian life. And uh, as a father must discipline his sons, so God disciplines the church, but he uses the church itself to be self-governing in that regard. He's given, in essence, the church authority to care for those needs and to bring correction. I have two sons, one is 16 and one is 14. I mean, I just can't imagine what would happen if I just decided I wasn't gonna ever discipline my kids. You know, imagine if you ever did that. Well, you'd have chaos at home. You'd have spoiled, rotten, miserable, unpleasant, awful kids. No one would want to be around them. They would be troublesome. They'd be, probably have a, a, a police uh, rap sheet already. And, uh, but we discipline our children because we know it's our obligation. In the same way God has laid out this father-son or mother-son, mother-daughter relationship. Also, friendships and acquaintances. The Bible talks about iron sharpening iron. In Proverbs chapter 9, it talks about rebuking a wise man, and he will love you. Instruct a wise man, and he will be wiser still. Teach a righteous man, and he will add to his learning. And then we've got the heavenly father-child uh, relationship that we all have in our relationship with God. And in Hebrews chapter 12, which is actually an Old Testament quote, he says, my son, don't make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Listen to this, very important. No one or no discipline seems pleasant at the time. It's painful and it's going to be painful whatever the problem you have in your church. It's just a matter of whether you're going to survive it or advance because of it. It isn't pleasant at the time, but it's painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. And then, of course, we have the shepherds and the flock. Um, Paul, in his words to 2 Timothy, says, preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. When we find that word again and again in the scriptures, the pastor is to rebuke and correct the church. Now, that's not a position I really like. I, I, I know a lot of you, and I know most of you know that I'm not the guy with a big paddle. It's going to sound like that today because I'm teaching on that topic. But I really love people. But I have learned that, that love isn't simply hugging people and, and encouraging them with words of grace and peace and joy. Loving people also includes being courageous enough and bold enough and caring enough and committed enough to correct someone when they're wrong. I liked what, uh, what Gail said a few minutes ago when he was sharing about the, the pastor, the, the worship pastor. You know how many people probably felt the same thing in that service but wouldn't speak up and say anything? And that guy would have done that in two more services. But Gail was courageous enough. He was willing to lose that man's friendship for a day and maybe regain it later in order to honor God and to advance the purposes of the Lord. 
And so shepherds are called to discharge all the duties of the ministry, including church discipline, encourage and rebuke with all authority. We have a lot of biblical examples of, of rebuking taking place. Uh, we've got um, Hanani the seer confronting King Asa for his sin of relying on foreign kings. Uh, we've got Ezariah the priest and 80 other courageous priests that were confronting Uzziah for burning incense. And then we have Nathan who confronted David's sin over Bathsheba and Uriah. We also have a number of New Testament examples where, where Paul actually names names, uh, where he exercised church discipline. Of course, the man who was sleeping with his stepmother in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and 2 Corinthians chapter 2. And then we have specific names where Peter, Paul calls him on the carpet for his duplicity and his hypocrisy in fellowshipping with Gentiles and then pretending that he wasn't when he was with the Jews. Hymenaeus and Alexander, they were rebuked and named by Paul for blasphemy. Uh, Phygelus and Hermogenes for deserting Paul, and her, uh, uh, Hymenaeus and Philetus for wandering from the truth. So all of these examples are really there for us to realize that, that Paul was deadly serious about the church. He said, I want to present to, to God a pure bride. He wanted to be the man that God had called him to be. If you look at the end of his ministry, one of the things that you can't say about Paul is that he had a lot of friends. And one of the things that I feel like every man, every Christian man and woman has to make a decision is that what do you want at the end? The praise of people or the praise of God? Now I'm hoping I can have both. I mean, I want to I wanna have a lot of friends at the end. I hope I've got friends. I probably got maybe five or six and I'm working on more. I just signed up for Facebook about a week ago. I had three and I'm starting to kind of build up. So, so ramp me up if you're on Facebook, Bob Holman, just sign me up and, uh, and I'll click yes. Confirm, confirm, confirm. <laughs> because I'm feeling a little, a little naked and insecure when I only have three friends signed up. So I want friends, and I want to be loved by people. I want to be a blessing to people. But Paul only had a handful of friends at the end that he could name that were still with him. Why? Because this guy was so courageous and so bold and so on fire for God and so committed to the purity of the church that he preferred the favor and the blessing and the friendship of God over the approval of men. And as a result, he didn't go to his, uh, to his death with a whole lot of people in, 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 you know, standing by the graveside. But he was a man after God's heart. What, what are the things that trigger church discipline? Well, I've got three things that are listed here, and I think they kind of cover the gamut. And I'm just going to touch on these briefly. The first are sins that damage the doctrine of the church. And you can note the uh, reference there in Romans 16, 17. Secondly, sins that damage the unity of the church. Titus 3.10. This would be a divisive person, gossiping, slander, uh, things where people are trying to divide the congregation over some issue. Uh, thirdly, sins that damage the purity of the church. Uh, Paul talks about this, immorality, uh, sexuality, uh, greed, idolatry, slander, being a drunkard, a swindler. Some of these things are under that category of immorality. Paul says, don't even eat with a person that lives this kind of a way and yet names the name of Christ. Now, I want to talk about the heart of church discipline. And I know I'm flying through this, but I uh, hope you're hanging on. That's why I gave you notes, so that you can um, just fill in a few blanks. The heart of church discipline, I think, is fairly obvious. And so I'm not going to comment on this much, but it's so important. Because church discipline has to be done with the love of Christ. Church discipline is not a big stick uh, for an angry, uh, you know, unresolved person who has, you know, anger issues. This is not a platform for a pastor or a leader or an individual Christian to vent and to unload on someone. This is a, is a holy experience. This is a divine calling that God has given the church to govern itself under the authority and leadership of God the Father as directed by Jesus Christ. These are things that God has given to us to do. It's got to be done with the utmost care and with the heart of God. Otherwise, it will be abused. And I just want to say right out of the gate, I don't even think I need to talk about this, but, but there are certainly lots of people that abuse the church discipline process, but I can guarantee you they don't have the heart of Christ if they do. And I know that you guys have the heart of God. So I'm going to go through this very quickly. Number one, it's to be done after careful self-examination. Matthew chapter 7. Remember the story about uh, the, the, uh, the beam and the, the splinter? Well, that's what this is talking about. We need to examine ourselves so that we're not going in with a hypocritical heart. 
Secondly, it needs to be done with prayer and fasting. I love the example of Esther when she was going to face something that was very daunting to her. She said, I want everybody to fast with me. And uh, when you go through a church discipline process, or even just a personal confrontation with a friend who has sinned, either against you or just you, you're aware of a sin that they're struggling with, it's daunting. We hate confrontation, don't we? Most people just dread it. They would rather die than have to go and deal with this. But this is a divine calling. This is as important, if not maybe just as important, as teaching and, and giving the training in righteousness that 2 Timothy chapter 3 talks about. But the corrective and disciplinary part of that passage is necessary if the man or woman is to be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So we can't just do the training and the teaching and leave out the correction and the rebuking. If we want to prepare people for every good work, we've got to be willing to do all of it. It's a part of the package. We can't shy away from it if we are to serve the Lord. And so prayer and fasting is really essential. Thirdly, it's to be done with gentleness. Fourth, it's to be done without a critical spirit. That's what Matthew chapter 7 is often used to throw up in, in front of the church. Hey, the Bible says we're not to judge each other. The context of that text has to do with critical hypocritical judgment, not judicial judgment. The church is not called to criticize and to be critical of each other in, in our judgment, but we are called to a judicial role of making decisions about what's right for the church and what's moral and what's ethical and what's pure and what's lovely and of good report, all these things. We are called to bring a judicial decision to the table, and we're going to be talking about that uh, as we go through this. The, the next one, it's to be done without partiality. God will not tolerate partiality. He hates it. So we can't treat our friends any differently than we treat someone that's new. And having said that, we as leaders need to be willing to submit ourselves to that very same process if we are caught in some sin. And I tell our church all the time, uh, if I'm ever in sin, you confront me on it. And if I ever am found to be resistant, you take me through Matthew 18. I've taught you how to do it. I'm no exception. My family's no exception. There's no partiality. Next, it's to be done with patience. I know that sometimes people want to get problems resolved and they want to, they want to get the person out of the church and they boot them out and it's, it's a very unceremonious, uh, short, abbreviated process. Sometimes church discipline in our fellowship is taken up to a year sometimes more than two years, as we wait patiently through some of these stages, as we pray and fast and appeal. It all depends on the situation, of course. You don't want a pedophile in the Sunday school classroom teaching for two more years. Uh, but there are occasions where there's no continuing damage, but there is a need for repentance, and it's not resolved. There's a place for patience in this process. And then lastly, it's to be done with love. I think that's self-explanatory. Let's talk about the, the actual steps of church discipline. One of the ones that's not even listed here is the very first one, and it's an alternative to church discipline that all of us are exercising on a regular basis, and it's called self-discipline, self-discipline. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1, 7, Paul says, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. Some of your translations say self-control. On a daily basis, God is conforming us to the image of Jesus Christ. That's his plan for the church and for individual believers. In order for that to happen, there's this constant correction process that's going on. That's why when I have my quiet time in the morning, it's like, ooh, that's the man I'm supposed to be. Forgot since yesterday. I get back to the word. Oh, thank you, Lord, Holy Spirit, for reminding me. And then I get convicted of a sin on the next page, and it's like, I want to repent from that. This is the self-governing process of the Holy Spirit working in me. That's God's primary way of disciplining the church, is simply through the response that I have to the ministry of the Holy Spirit and through the Word of God. That's a very appropriate response and an appropriate way for the believer to handle sin. And so self-governing is um, a very important part of that process. So, but barring that, if a person is not self-governing, then, then Jesus lays out four basic steps. The first is private confrontation private confrontation. That's in Matthew 18, 15. And I'll just read it here br briefly. It says, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won your brother over. So the first, uh, the first stage is to have a private meeting with this individual where you're addressing 
their sin. And by the way, this isn't a, a passage that's just for leaders. This is for every Christian. It's to be exercised with your spouse. It's to be exercised with your children, with your friends at church, with people in your home fellowship, with people that you are aware of in the, in the Christian community that you're friends with. This is a, a universal practice within the church that every believer has an obligation and responsibility to carry out. Why? Well, because we all see sin in one another at times. Sometimes we can see it in another person better than they can see it themselves. But also because we all experience the sin that can, can occur against us. And when that, when that harm takes place, there's only really a couple of things you can do with it. You're either going to address it biblically or you're going to become bitter and angry and it's going to cause a problem with that person. And then the next likely step, if you don't take care of it biblically, is gossip and beginning to share it with a few people. And you're, you know, of course, you're getting prayer requests. You know, you're telling people to pray and they say, what's it for? And well, so-and-so kind of said something and it just hurt my feelings. Really? How did that happen? And off you go. That's how it usually happens. But the Bible says, if your brother sins against you, and uh, uh, that you are to go. That word go is in, in the present imperative. It means that you must go. It's not a suggestion. It's a command. It's in the present tense, meaning you are to continue going until this thing is resolved. You don't give up. Doesn't mean that you have to be a pest. Doesn't mean that you have to be knocking at their door at one in the morning. But there is a persistence until this problem is resolved. The other thing that it says that's important is that, that if your brother sins, now, it's important that when you go, that you've already evaluated this to make sure that this is an actual sin and not just hurt feelings. Sometimes people get their feelings hurt. I've had people come up to me and they start be behaving kind of strangely at church. And I can tell something's not right. And I'll, I'll say, hey, are you okay? Are we okay? You don't seem like you're yourself. And they'll say, well, two weeks ago, you know, you came to church and you walked right past me. And you didn't do what you normally do, which is hug me and say, how was your week and love me? And uh, that really hurt my feelings. Well, that's not a sin. That's an oversight. So when you go to someone with a problem, and that was fine to get that resolved, and we, we resolved that. But sometimes our feelings are hurt, but it has nothing to do with sin. This Matthew 18 process is not for hurt feelings. Hurt feelings are addressed in a, in, a, in a similar way, but you're not confronting them with sin. You're simply communicating and saying, hey, I got my feelings hurt. You probably didn't mean that, but this is kind of how I felt, and you get it worked out. This is when you're actually addressing a particular biblically identifiable sin. So I really encourage people that when we talk about the church discipline process, it's important that you have chapter and verse, and maybe a number of them, uh, prepared to show this person that their behavior, their conduct, their action is actually identifiable as a sin. The third thing it says is show him his fault. Aorist imperative. It means that you are to show this person definitively once and for all their fault. And actually in the Greek it means to bring to light something that's in darkness. And so we are to bring to light something that this person may or may not completely understand as being sinful. The last thing, or next to the last thing, is that it says just between the two of you. This step is to be done privately. Um, personally, this is my conviction. My wife has no business knowing about any of these things until I've gone to someone first. You know, some people, I think, have the perception and the idea that if you're married, well, your spouse is kind of exempt from the concept of this privacy clause. And I don't believe that because before my wife is my wife, she's a sister and a daughter of God. And so what applies to the Bible applies to my wife. And so for me to sit there and, and debrief with my wife and go on and on and on about somebody in our church or whatever, I think is wrong. That's my conviction. Some of you may share a different conviction. Uh, but I'm convicted that, um, that the times that I've gone to my wife in the past and done that, I've actually sinned against her for several reasons. One is I've gossiped. I've brought information to her that may be true, might not be true. I haven't talked to the person yet. I haven't even verified the facts yet. But secondly, I've laid a burden on her and an emotion that comes with that knowledge that someone's done something wrong, maybe against the church or maybe even against me personally, and now she has to carry that baggage. And then the worst thing is, is that if I get it resolved, she's not there to see the resolution. And so she carries this with her, and, and I've done it to her. I'm guilty of that. So I made a decision a long time ago that I really refrain. Some of the things that I've gone through in church, my wife knows nothing about. 
And I shared some of the things with her this morning about what God reminded me of some of the problems. She says, when did that happen? What was that? <laughs> where, where, where was I? And it's like, well, don't ask any questions. It's all resolved. God won the brother over. And that's all that needs to be known. So it needs to be just between the two of you. It means not only the information is private, but the meeting itself is private. Why just the two of you? Well, number one is that you might not have all the facts. Secondly, you're protecting the offender's reputation because your objective is restoration. And thirdly, you're eliminating additional damaging sin, namely gossip and slander from permeating the church. Finally, it says if he listens to you, and this word in the, in the Greek actually means to listen with the intent to act upon that. It's not simply just hearing the verbiage, but if they listen and act on it, then you have won your brother over. It means to gain or win, and originally it had to do with accumulating wealth. And what happens when we actually win a brother over, it took the courage and the strength and the time to confront a brother or a sister in the Lord over sin that damages the kingdom and, and detracts from the purity of the church and from even that person's personal life. And we win that brother over. What we've done is we've accumulated wealth back into the kingdom of God. We have brought treasure back into the purity of the work of God in the church. And we are investing in something that's precious to God. I think about probably more than 90% of all church discipline is taken care of in this first step. That's just a, a, a rough guess. But that first step, most often, is all it takes. That one confrontation in love. Sometimes it takes a few conversations. This isn't a one-time meeting. It doesn't have to be one meeting. Uh, but this one step is oftentimes all that it takes to bring a correction. And the, the uh, wonderful example that Gail brought up with the worship leader is a case in point. However, if the person fails to understand, disagrees, or resists that correction, Jesus gives us the next step in Matthew 18, 16. Take some witnesses with you. By the way, sometimes we, uh, uh, people have interpreted this to mean that the witnesses are people that witness the event. That's not what it's referring to. It can mean that. But these are witnesses to the next step, which is step two, which is the second stage of confrontation. Why is God concerned that there be witnesses? Well, he wants to assure that both the facts of the situation and the process itself are verified and in keeping with the truth of his word. So he says, I want you to get two or three witnesses to join with you, preferably, in my opinion, people that know the person or know some of the circumstances and have some authority and leadership, bringing those people with you. But those people are there to witness the events as they unfold. And a couple of reasons. One is that they provide protection for both parties so that whatever is said can be verified. Secondly, they're to witness to the facts of the meeting. Was the offender treated fairly and with love? Was the offender actually guilty of a biblical sin? Was the offender properly rebuked and an appeal for repentance offered? Was the offender either, the offender either responded in repentance or refused to repent? And they also add strength and affirmation and counsel to that meeting, encouraging this person, if they truly have sinned, to repent. And they're there to provide a reliable and accurate testimony for step three, should this brother or sister refuse to respond. What I love about this model is that the first stage, you've got one person that cares enough about this person to address the sin. And then you add two or three witnesses. Now you've got at least three or four people who have come together in love, in care, for the person's spiritual health and the welfare of the church. Now you've got four people appealing to this person. It's not a secret anymore. And it's a beautiful thing that God has laid out. The third step is to tell it to the church. If this person is not responsive to these three or four witnesses who love that person, have given adequate time for this person to repent, laid out what's required for repentance, if there's any restitution necessary, all these things are laid out. The third step is to tell it to the church. There needs to be adequate time, of course, between those steps. And I, I suggest that, uh, though the Bible doesn't speak of this, that when you get to stage three and you're about to move on that stage is that you send out a formal letter that's registered that goes to this person. And you explain several things. One is informing them that the third and fourth steps of church discipline are pending. Secondly, to communicate what will be disclosed to the church at the particular meeting that is going to be taking place. 
Thirdly, to share the future collective response of the church. In other words, how are you going to direct the church to respond to this person's sin and unrepentant state? And, and so that will be communicated to the person in the letter in advance. Fourthly, to provide a date and time when the repentance must be evidenced in order to stop the process from going any further. If you put that out in a letter, it is supremely fair, and you're giving a person a chance to have the opportunity to know exactly what's coming. It's wrong to surprise people at meetings. That's not ethical, it's not moral, it's not biblical. And so the person needs to have full advanced knowledge of what's going to take place at that meeting, should that meeting be necessary. What does the Bible mean when it says the church? Well, a lot of people have different opinions. Sometimes they think it's the board of directors, sometimes it's the leadership team, sometimes it's the membership of the church, sometimes it's the entire gathered church on Sunday morning. But the truth is, is the word ecclesia means the gathered assembly of the saints. It doesn't really tell us. But I can tell you after my study and my research on this and even in preparation from this, I am becoming more and more convinced it needs to be in the large body of the believers of the church. And the reason is, is that the final stage gives the entire church the knowledge and the information to have a, a whole, complete appeal by the entire body of Christ. In other words, there's no loose ends. It's not these people over here in the dark, and those people don't know what's going on, but only these five guys and their wives know what's really happened. And so everybody, nobody knows how to respond. It's like, what are we supposed to do? Are we supposed to love them or reject them? I mean, everyone's confused. That's resolved if it's taken to the church. And I, am, I become convinced myself in my study that I have done this wrong because traditionally we've done this with our leadership team, which is open, anyone can come, but it usually comprises about maybe 20% of the church versus the whole body. And to be honest with you, we've seen the negative effects of not giving everyone complete information and a knowledge on how to respond to the fallen brother or sister. When that meeting takes place, you're to tell them the name of the offender, the general nature of the sin, a reporting of the first two stages in effort in Matthew 18, and clear guidelines on how to relate to the offender. What's the purpose of telling the church? Number one is to have a whole church people aggressively praying that they will turn from their sin. Secondly, for the, uh, for the people who have been hurt or damaged to have support and prayer as well, because sometimes there's some very critical damage that's done to people because of sin. Thirdly, for the protection of the church from the work of the enemy. This is so important. You don't want to have two people praying over this. You want the whole church praying for this person's salvation and repentance and deliverance. Thirdly, to restore or to resource the entire body to lovingly urge this person to repent and to commun communicate solidarity as a church on this issue of the purity of the fellowship. So now we've gone from one person loving this individual to three to four people loving this individual, to now the entire Christian community that they associate with and relate with, appealing to them. There is nowhere they can turn where they won't receive the same loving message of we are praying for your repentance. Now, if the offender still refuses to repent, Jesus gives us the final step, which is ex exclusion from church. Jesus said, let him be to you as a Gentile or a tax gatherer, in essence, considering them as unbelievers outside the covenant, outside the promise, outside the fellowship, outside the blessing of the church. What this doesn't mean is it doesn't give us the right to be cruel or mean-spirited. What it does mean is that we treat this person as a non-member of God's body or fellowship. Though they claim to be a Christian, they are not acting in accordance with those that walk with God. They're not to associate with the offender on a personal, friendly level. They're not to be in fellowship with the offender. They're not to eat with the offender got scriptures for that as well, and they're not to invite the offender to participate in the benefits of Christian assembly. In our own fellowship, one of the problems that we've had because we haven't addressed the whole assembly is sometimes people are saying, hey, come on over, and they're thinking they're doing a good thing by reaching out to this person. What they're really doing is they're undermining the process because they're giving comfort when they should be giving the grace of discomfort to that person. And so they invite him over almost clandestinely, thinking, well, I don't want the pastor to know or the leaders to know, but I like this guy, and, and uh, I know he's sinned, but, you know, somebody's got to be nice to him. But you can see the problem is there needs to be a solid, unified effort from the church appealing to this person, not leaving, you know, half of the church 
loving the guy and bringing him over meals and helping him and going golfing and all that stuff, while the other half is exercising church discipline because it sends a very mixed message. It's kind of like a, a two-parent home where the, uh, the dad is, is the authoritarian and the, and the mom is the person that's very liberal uh, and, and not disciplining the child. The same kind of problem. Most of the time, when you get to step four, the person is not going to repent. But I have to tell you that my wife and I have experienced a, a slew of events where people have repented years later. We had two windows in the last, is it last five years or so where people that we addressed years earlier repented. The one that I mentioned about the pastor running off with a worship leader, uh, you know, this was like, gosh, this was, must have been 25 years ago or longer. It took him about five or six years to finally call me back and repent. And, and he repented to all the people in the church, as far as I know. He called everybody on the list and went down and, and repented. Uh, we've had other people that uh, I prayed for and loved. I still called these people on their birthdays. I, I call people in our church on their birthdays and I sing to them. Kind of goofy, but they like it. And, uh, and, and I, I still call the people that are in, under church discipline. And I'll sing to them and I'll say, you know what? Love you. We miss you. We, we, we know you're not here. And I'm appealing to you again, would you please come back to Jesus? Would you please repent? You got a whole church full of people that would welcome you and would be so thrilled to have you back. What's interesting is that, and I'm running out of time here, is the summary of verses that follow, verses 18 through 20, which have been horribly abused over the years by the church because the context has nothing to do with prayer. It has everything to do with church discipline. And Jesus says, I tell you the truth, that whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. What he's saying is that under rabbinical tradition, the rabbis, under the authority of God, had the judicial responsibility before God to render decisions as it related to the function of God's people. And so they would hear a, a, a problem in the church, and they, they would make a decision in the temple. And God says, in the same way that I gave the rabbis that authority, church, I'm giving you that authority, and I'm saying what you bind, having gone through this process, with all the witnesses and all the people watching this process who were influenced by the Spirit of God and are guided by the Word of God, I am giving you the authority to bind those over who refuse to repent and to loose those who have repented. And what you've done on earth, I will do in heaven. Now, that's a remarkable statement. I don't know if that puts the fear of God in you, but it puts the fear of God in me. Because God is saying, you are acting as my ambassadors, and I am going to verify and affirm your decision by either loosing or binding. And the second part of this verse is just as interesting, I think. It says, for where two or three come together in my name, there I am with them. Boy, has everybody been to a prayer meeting? Probably a lot of you have said it at a prayer meeting. Oh, Lord. Thank you for the time we have here tonight or this morning because your word says where two or three gather in your name, you are with us in our midst. It has nothing to do with prayer. This is a judicial process. The context is a judicial process of church discipline. And God says as you exercise this judicial responsibility to maintain a pure bride for my son, I am with you in that judicial process. And I am yeaing and affirming and amening what's taking place for the purity of my church. I want to read just a, a testimonial, if you'll allow me another couple of minutes. We had a woman, um, and this came up because I asked actually a number of my staff people to write little blurbs on their experience with church discipline. I got a whole fistful of them. I can't read them all to you. But we had a situation a number of years ago where a woman that I'll call Mrs. R because she ran retail at our church, uh, and I actually called her Mrs. R uh, because of that, even though that's not a real name. Uh, married to her husband for probably 10 or 15 years, beautiful kids, three beautiful kids. Uh, suddenly left her husband and started drinking, going to bars, and hooked up with a guy who was not a believer and would be, was totally unresponsive to our corrective process. We took her through all the stages of church discipline. She wouldn't show up for the final two, uh, but we did, we did exercise that process. And uh, at the end of it, I'm thinking every time I saw her, I'd appeal to her, encourage the church to appeal to her. No, no response. This went on for years and years and years. 
And then they started coming because their kids were performing in Christmas and Easter and that kind of a thing, and they'd show up. And I'm like, wow, it's really great to see you. And, um, you know, I wouldn't put pressure on them. I wouldn't be ugly or anything, but I'd call them up after the, the Christmas service a week later and said, I, you know, I noticed you're, you're at church. Are you wanting to come back? Because we miss you. We love you. We want you to come back. It's been too long. We're ready to restore you. Would you like to be restored? And of course, years went on. I'd sing to them on their birthdays and say the same thing, and they weren't ready. But a few years ago, I saw her at church again. I think it was for Easter. And, uh, and gave her the same little patter, you know, about appealing to her. And she said, I would like to come back. What do I need to do? Her husband, in the meantime, uh, long after the affair and long after the dissolution of the first marriage, the, the first husband and his family are still coming to church. Now she and her new husband want to come to church. You see how awkward this is and weird this is? This can't happen. I said, there's a process that you need to go through. She says, whatever I need to do, I'll do. How about the new guy? Will the new guy do whatever he needs to do? He's willing to do it because he loves me. Let me read to you a comment. Uh, this is what she wrote me. I asked her for a little blurb on this church discipline process, which happened a couple of years ago. We, we brought her before the church. Uh, she, we dealt with the issues again, reminded people of the actual sin, and she repented, and her new husband also, who at the time was not a Christian, also repented, who is now a Christian. My experience with church discipline, I have to say, was difficult but loving, kind, and most of all, healing. I had already asked God to forgive me. I also asked a few others, one by one, that I felt I needed to ask for forgiveness. I was ready and willing to make things right. I have to say that that, that wasn't uh, always the case. But from that point, I just asked God what was next. Talk about timing. That's when Pastor Bob approached. This was not the first time. He approached us in a caring and loving way, parentheses, I stress caring and loving, and asked if we would be willing to have a meeting with the people who we thought we needed to be, who needed to be there to be reconciled. He had made a few suggestions, too. We just spoke straight to the people who we had hurt or offended and asked for their forgiveness. Of course, it wasn't easy. There were many tears, and I'm sure it was one of the hardest things that I've ever had to do. But I had to put myself in that position, or I had put myself in that position, and I did want to make things right with the Lord and my brothers and sisters in Christ as well. Then we ate cake. That's what we do at our church. We have a party when this happens. We actually have a cake, a welcome home cake, and it was a beautiful experience. The benefits that have come out of this are just, wow. God can and will restore a hundredfold when you humble yourself and make things right with him and others. The benefits that come from doing that are for everyone involved, healing, forgiveness, peace, freedom, growth, restoration, others not feeling strange around you because they don't know how to act. God gets the glory. I have to say that we also have the best group of loving, caring, and forgiving people in our church. Church discipline is a hard thing because people don't understand why you pastors, she has in parentheses, why you pastors can't just stay out of their business. <laughs> I love that. But when we come into a fellowship and put ourselves under a pastor, he is accountable for how, we, how he leads God's people. So we are affecting a lot more people than just ourselves. We thank you and she thanks me, Pastor Bob, for your loving way, straightforwardness, and just wanting to do God's will. I want to read one more. I've got too many to, to read here, but... It just came in on my email, and this is, this is the new guy who wasn't a Christian when he entered into this process. I'll call him Mark. He says, at the time of our meeting, I was a new believer, and, I, and he really wasn't, but he was just, just on the edge, fringe, and I was a bit angry that I had to go to a meeting with my new wife and ask for forgiveness to a bunch of people that I didn't know. <laughs> I was thinking, who are these people that I have to justi justify myself to them? I did it because I was deeply in love with my wife and she felt she needed to be there, so I went to support her. The hardest part was watching the pain on my wife's face as she went through this process. Though I could see that when it was done, she felt weight lifted off of her. I, at the time, didn't feel any weight. Uh, um, let's see, hang on. I, at the time, didn't feel any weight, so it was just a process. I, didn't, uh, I did feel bad and a little guilty for what I had done, However, now a few years later, I can see that it was totally God working, and I can see that he has created relationships and restored old ones and has shown me the power of what he can do. 
We can now fellowship with other believers of God and not feel that anyone still has a problem. I'm still growing, and I'm sure I will see the fruit of, God, of what God has done in this and in my own life. I know that guilt and hard feelings can fade over time, but they never really go away. And it is great that through this process of church discipline, God has healed that area. It is done. Isn't that beautiful? I wish I could read you the rest of these, but I don't have time. What I will tell you is that church discipline is God's method. We can try a thousand different ways, and we will survive those events, but we will not advance the kingdom through those events. When we do it God's way, you will see beautiful fruit. I'll just add one closing thought. The husband who was abandoned by this woman, still going to our church, was a part of this reconciliation process. Forgiveness was requested of him individually by his wife and this new husband. And forgiveness was requested of all the children. Forgiveness was requested of the church, and our church surrounded them and loved them. I can't explain it. I can't possibly wrap my mind or my arms around it. But all these families now fellowship at our church without any animosity, without any anger or resentment. They, the kids just wander between the two homes. They, the couples, all the, and, and the, the one man is still single, doesn't have a wife whose who's wife left, and he goes over to their house and plays games with the kids, and they come over to his house and play games, and they homeschool the kids together, and the church accepts them. No one in our church ever thinks anything poorly about this couple because we did it God's way. God can do it. I commend it to you. I encourage you to be brave and to be willing. And I want to read one last quote from our associate pastor, if I can find it, just to close. I got so many papers up here. This is from Pastor Bruce. I would encourage every church to not fear the uncomfortable and time consuming process of confronting and seeking repentance prior to expelling someone from fellowship. It may not always work to a beautiful result, but if the process is what God is asking of us, then our obedience to do the right thing is pleasing to God, and our obedience to God's plan becomes just as, or our disobedience to God's plan becomes just as grievous as the sins of those we are trying to correct. We have a choice of fork in the road every time we have a problem with someone, and every one of us have a responsibility. It can't be shirked. You can't push it off. You can't hope someone else does it. You, the church, have been given the tools, the honor, the responsibility, and the judicial oversight under the kingdom of God and under the leadership of your church to maintain the purity of the church, the bride of Christ, and also to bless the church with men and women who are reconciled both to God and to one another. Father, we thank you for this time this morning, and I pray that you bless our lunch now as we go, and God, that you would encourage the men and women here, myself included, to be bold and courageous. We talk about ventures of faith, doing great things for God, and God, this is one of the greatest things we can do is to maintain the purity and holiness of your church, the Bride of Christ. So bless us in that effort, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.